morning. Uh, I'm Maria Goicoechea, and I'm very glad to be with you in this edition of Friday Frontiers. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Vicky Garnett for the invitation, and I hope the audience can apply some of the aspects of my talk today to their own project. So let's start. Uh, sorry, I have to click. Well, um, the project I'm going to talk about um, springs from a concern that some of you may have also experienced. Uh, as you all know, libraries worldwide are investing a significant portion of their resources in digitizing their collections. Since European countries are aware that digitizing their cultural heritage is, a, is an essential step towards preserving literature of the past. Those texts which are deemed important enough to be maintained in their collective memories and pass on to future generations. However, the expectations associated with such an enormous economic effort and also time consuming process are not always met when analyzing the actual statistics of readers' access to digitized collections. Digitized formats are immensely valuable for researchers, but may seem dry and unappealing to broader audiences, especially when the original content was intended for children. Moreover, as Dr. Yeland acknowledges, and I'm going to quote from one of her articles, the vast majority of digital cultural data preserved in archives is inaccessible due to privacy, copyright, or technical issues. Well, in the last decade, the emphasis has been shifted from digitization to recycling and reuse of already digitized material. Even though there is still an imbalance between the amount of data available regarding the evolution of the digitization process of cultural heritage across European countries, as you can see in this chart from the enumerate study, um, there's an imbalance between the amount of data we have uh, about digitization and the scarcity of information with respect to accessibility and use of digitized public domain material. So with the objective of facilitating access to digitized collections, libraries around the world have been experimenting with different digital formats of enriched text that provide a series of superimposed layers of contextual information, for example, annotations and multimedia elements that serve as bridges between the old text and the new readers. So in this talk, I'm going to share with you the workflow, including setbacks and discoveries of a project dedicated to exploring the field of electronic edition for children literature through the implementation of a model of enriched digital text. Well, this project involves several uh, key steps that provide the structure of this talk. First, the research and concept phase. I will begin by presenting the preliminary research conducted on digitized formats of popular children's literature found in specialized libraries. And I will focus on the models provided by two institutions, the British Libraries Turning the Pages software and the National Libraries of Spain Madgazine software. After describing those models, the discussion will revolve around the different prototypes we tested for creating a digitally enhanced edition of our selected text, which was a collection of stories entitled Plague of Dragons published by Calleja Publishing House, which in Spain is very famous, in 1923, and based on the Spanish adaptations of Edith Nesbitt's tales. And this was the discovery. We gained some practice creating prototypes using commercial software. And then we ended up developing a custom-made solution. Throughout the process, we integrated the feedback from 100 primary and secondary level students, sorry, teachers and also students, who participated in the design of the second prototype. And well, I can also share with you the results of different studies we carried out in, in the classroom. 
To finish, I will discuss uh, the organization of this project's workflow, which has involved the annotations of 25 researchers, a collaborative mass translation effort with students to produce the English version of the tales, and the contribution of 16 professionals responsible for the dramatized audio narration. So let's start with our uh, concept phase. Well, the first stage of this project involved a conceptual reflection regarding the definition of an enriched uh, digital edition that is not uh, an expert scholarly edition, but actually one that is aimed at facilitating a general access to digitized literature of the past. But however, we are researchers now, so we depart from the tradition of scholarly critical editions but we changed the objective. Now the objective is to use the apparatus of critical editions to increase accessibility to primary source materials for a specific audience, children. Of course, we had another motive. Now the ulterior motive of this effort is to experiment with the possibilities of electronic textuality to increase children's reading skills from a transliteracy perspective. That is one that facilitates a fluidity of movement across a range of technologies, media, and context, and which involves not only increasing their digital skills, but also their knowledge of a multiplicity of other media and textual formats, including print. So let us start by explaining what we understand by a digitally enriched edition. Maybe other researchers have other approaches and it will be interesting to discuss this later. Well, from our part, as opposed to a plain digitization of a text with just the basic framework for reading, like a navigation interface with a limited amount of possibilities, such as choosing page view mode, page turning or doing zoom, or even downloading and sharing options, well, an enriched edition provides a reading context that can be used to introduce the text from a philological perspective. And I'm thinking philological in a broader sense, also cultural, social, etc. Making use of a variety of media, text annotation, oral narration, reading activities, different types of media like videos, links, to provide a more interactive reading experience. So this is for us, no? an enriched digital edition. Of course, there have been many attempts at implementing through digital scaffolding such a vision no? of enriching the text using uh, digital uh, textuality. So we will discuss later some examples, such as particular editions of The Wasteland and Beowulf. But in this case, we needed to depart from works already selected and digitized by librarians at the National Library of Spain, which was one of the partners in this project, and find the ideal format to create an enriched digital edition of them, since that was one of the objectives also, to increase the visibility of already uh, digitized uh, material. Well. An exploration of children's literature collections of digitized books has shown us that the access to these collections, often associated with academic libraries and their projects, is aimed at a specialized audience with very concise descriptions of the main characteristics shared by the collection, because of course the researcher already knows them. The reading framework uh, varies in the possibilities it offers but it is mainly oriented to facilitate a high quality image exploration without giving options to, for example, add the reader's annotations or any contextual information. We only have the works library card and metadata. Only in some cases, you will, can, you can, for example, select um, areas, download them for your own use, and that's very nice, but, uh, one uh, model that I found interesting is this one from uh, the Wal Baldwin Library of Historical Children's Literature from the University of Florida. Well, this is an early version 
And in this one, register users could add a brief note to the book they had explored. But this annotation was attached to the book itself, not to any specific part of the book or extract. So, uh, but this version uh, is no longer in use. Well, you can, I think, access uh, through it through a specific link if you search for it. But now the one that is used is a new version. Uh, and this has, of course, all their features. We have no longer the possibility to annotate. Now, hypothesis is recommended for annotation. But on the other hand, this version improves usability and accessibility by making the new site mobile responsive. And uh, something interesting as well is that it has a stats feature. And you can access and see the items total views uh, per year also or per month, which is a sign, I think, that accessibility and transparency is a growing concern uh, for libraries. But one of the models that really caught our attention is the British Library Virtual Books Collection. And uh, this has really inspired our project. The software use for these enriched books is called Turning the Pages. And it was developed by the British Library in collaboration with Armadillo Systems. It was originally released in 1997, so it's very old already. And it has uh, gone through several versions and now it has developed into a full content management system that allows libraries to generate their own turning the pages, kiosks, and publish online versions of enriched books with use open standards like HTML5. Well, characterized by a great image quality, and I, I think it's also nice the simplicity of its design. I think the result is outstanding. It has pop-up annotations as overlays that allow you to see the page underneath and you can move the pop-up window um, as you like. And the note can be read or and also listened. This simple approach proves very versatile since the annotations can be used to include the diplomatic transcription in some cases or the editorial commentaries in others. Audio notes can expand on the textual commentary or just replicate it, depending on the different approaches that each book's enriched edition elicits. Well, we consider, for example, buying the license of this software. It costs like approximately 5,000 pounds as a one-time cost, and then learn to use this software to create our own enriched editions. But, but we found an important limitation in this content management system. And this is that it only allows one annotation per page. So it does not permit to select specific areas, for example, phrases or words within the page. So even for an institution as important as the British Library, the process of creating enriched editions of digitized books is expensive. Therefore, it has only been implemented in literary jewels and precious manuscripts, like for example, the notebook of William Blake, which is beautiful. Um, we're using, for example, this CMS uh, framework, whereas custom-made books um, with animated illustrations or the annotations in the selected areas, these are exclusively commissioned for special exhibits, but uh, they're very rare. Well, this was one of the models that we used, and then this uh, was the second one. A this was a model used for uh, an interactive version of Don Quixote, which was developed by the National Library of Spain in collaboration with Telefónica. I don't know if you know Telefónica, but this is a Spanish multinational telecommunications company. And of course, they have a lot of money. And also the company Mad Pixel, who was the developer. In this case, we have two versions. The first one that I'm showing is from 2010, and this one is our favorite version, actually. 
because it was a custom-made edition created with very high quality digitization of copies from Don Quixote's first editions. And it's very self-contained, like within the same reading framework, you have all the editorial material at hand. Uh, for example, you can see Don Quixote's itinerary in a map. You can also uh, read the summaries of the reference chivalry novels, um, a chronology of main editions, a uh, gallery of illustrations, etc. And uh, I think this edition implied a great effort at synthesizing contextual information and integrating it smoothly in the reading experience. Like it's turning the pages counterpart here, we also have a double page uh, format and whole screen reading format as well. And, and the icons are very clear and the text navigation is very easy. So I'm gonna show you now the second version of Don Quixote, which was done with uh, a software called Mad Gazine, developed by this company, Mad Pixel. And this substituted the first version, which disappeared because it had been done with Flash. And you know what happened with Flash works. So after the custom-made projects of interactive Don Quixote, and there was also uh, an interactive Leonardo, which was a very beautiful edition of Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Madrid Codex, Matt Pixel offered the National Library of Spain a tool called Madgazine, and this is the one that you can see here. It's a cloud platform to create interactive magazines for webs, tablets, and smartphones which can be used without any programming knowledge. And for a monthly fee, it hosts the client's magazines in its cloud. So it's very easy to have access to these interactive editions because they're actually not in the library um, a server. But if you have the premium license, and I guess the library bought this one, the CMS can also be uploaded in the client's server. In this case, there is no standalone software that you can buy, but for small projects, there is a free version. And I think the free version is very interesting for teachers that want to practice interactive um, edition with their students, because uh, if the project is not very long, they can use this um, software. Well, as an exploration of this second version of interactive Don Quixote shows, the kiosk solution has dynamited the circumscribed reading framework of the early version and dispersed its editorial content into a collection of interconnected publications. And here we see the difference. Now, um, the previous software or the British Library software, Turning the Pages, is specific for the creation of enriched books. However, Magazine is designed to create many different types of products from interactive magazine to also museum or brand catalogs. And its functionality, its functionality is better uh, suited to online publications rather than to enrich editions of all books. So um, this is, for example, how the second version of the interactive Don Quixote looks. You have lost all the other icons and contextual information. So you have to go from one uh, publication to the other. However, um, there was something that inspired us from this uh, software, and is that uh, you have the possibility to introduce two different types of links in selected areas. Uh, one, uh, for example, like this one is a redirection to other pages, but when you see the plus sign, that's a, a multimedia pop-up uh, note. So, at this point uh, in our research, we had already conceived our ideal format, uh, which was a compact reading interface similar to the one provided by Turning the Pages, um, but that um, allowed, we, we wished to find a format that allowed to integrate uh, textual or audio annotations in specific areas of the page. So we suspected that this entailed a custom-made edition, 
but we nevertheless accepted the offer of the National Library to use their software, Magazine, this one, uh, as a training process and to also secure easy publication in the National Library, with this, which is not a little thing. Um, so the next step was choosing a source, uh, a source text attractive enough to justify such an effort. To select our text, we search inside the collection of digitized uh, children books, focusing on the works of the Spanish Silver Age. Why this period? Well, this period that uh, goes between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the Spanish Civil War, uh, that is from 1898 to 1936, was the area of expertise of one of the research teams involved in the project, the LOEP group. So we, we began searching in that specific time frame. But most of the titles pre-selected from this period reflected an overtly didactical and moralizing intention that we believe it would be certainly like off-putting to contemporary children. However, suddenly we found a collection of stories that was very, very interesting. And this collection is called Plague of Dragons. It was published by the famous Saturnino Calleja Publishing House in 1923, so 100 years from today. And from its first story, also entitled Plague of Dragons, the narration emerged as fresh, humorous, even prophetic, as you will see if you read the first story. And I was instantly intrigued by the identity of the author behind its conception. However, Calleja's uh, publishing company had this vision that illustration was key to attract younger readers, and they placed its marketing bait on the names of the two famous illustrators that had participated in this edition, Federico Rivas and Rafael de Penagos, but gave no credit whatsoever to the author or the translator of the tales. So the writer is anonymous. A poor translation uh, in, found in, in the first story, uh, a poor translation of castor oil, which in Spanish is aceite de ricino, and it was translated literally like beaver oil. Uh, well, this pointed us in the direction of um, a translation, that we were reading a translation from an English source, but we still didn't know who the author was. Uh, it was we found that it was Edith Nesbitt thanks to the recycling of an illustration, because later Calleja actually published Edith Nesbitt's stories. Uh, and um, Plague of Dragons is from the year 1923. And the following year, uh, he published in a very luxurious um, collection, Edith Nesbitt's Tales. So we found that they both reused um, one of the illustrations, so we knew it was Edith Nesbitt. So, well, so I I'm, I'm guess many of you know Edith Nesbitt, but if you're not familiar with her, you're certainly missing a delightful experience. Uh, Nesbitt was a British writer of singular talent who the editor Saturnino Calleja made known to the Spanish public through her publications uh, of her stories, like in these two books in the bottom, but he also profited from you know, her gift in a series of adaptations which were published anonymously. And, and we realized this through this uh, project. So, well, at this point of the concept phase, uh, we already knew uh, the software we were using, or at least we had an idea of the ideal format. And uh, the the interesting thing is that the technical and content decisions that we made at this point would determine the future stages of the project in non-trivial ways. For example, deciding to introduce annotations in image areas would compromise access through smaller devices such as phones. Whereas choosing a popular collection of children's stories instead of a more widely researched canonical work of literature, you know, one of these yules like Don Quixote. Well, this allowed us to contribute with new discoveries regarding authorial origin and cultural adaptation techniques 
that reveal the editorial practices of the period. So we could add something, not to the history of philology. So let's talk a little about uh, prototyping. Well, learning to use magazine uh, was not difficult, um, but we felt very constrained by the limitations of the platform. We tried to cover, uh, to overcome those limitations, as you will see, in ways that were not anticipated by the developers, but which were not very satisfying for us. Uh, we decided to use this software with the first story, and this is how it looks. You can see you only have two um, original uh, types of annotation. And we introduced this audio uh, icon. But of course, uh, we introduced that using the possibility of introducing images and links in pop-up notes. So it's not really an icon, but a little tiny pop-up note. But clicking on it only redirects the reader uh, to um, the audio file, which is actually in a sound archive in a different web page. So you can have the two web pages open and you can listen to the narration while reading the story, but it's not neat, it's not well no? integrated. So we only edited two tales uh, of the story, Veraneo Estropeado, Spoiled Summer Holiday and Plague of Dragons. And we made use of the kiosk to um, connect the translation in English as well with their audio in English. Um, we also used the kiosk to include the contextual information, such as some content about the publishing house and uh, another booklet about dragons in literary tradition. Um, but on the other hand, we had the advantage of publishing our enriched editions in the National Library webpage after a very smooth editorial process. And, and I think uh, this was also something that in the end was very uh, useful. So this is how the, the English translations look. And we decided to go for a second custom-made, you know, prototype this type this time, which was a more daring, challenging uh, process. And not all the researchers followed us in this uh, part of the project, uh, but we thought that we needed to do or try to do something on our own. So for our second custom-made prototype, we engage on further research in the field of enriched books, specifically for children. And we discover, you know, different uh, interesting publication houses dedicated to uh, animated books, uh, etc. From this review of children digitized books on the web, we extracted some ideas, um, such as the importance given to dramatize audio narration which can also make the books accessible to children that have some visual disability. And the importance of using interactive exercises to evaluate reading uh, comprehension. However, we realized we're, we're not experts on you know, children education. We realized we needed the expertise of teachers working with children uh, on an everyday basis, not to, to see how to approach the design of this second prototype. So I think that the decision to take into consideration the needs of teachers through a survey was a fundamental step that greatly improved the tool's functionality, as you will see. Well, through a series of online questionnaires, we introduced 100 primary and secondary school teachers to the field of enriched digital books. So they already knew that this uh, could be made. And we asked them not to express their needs, what type of competences do you practice through reading in the classroom? And we synthesized their needs into different groups. And then we created, and later we distilled those needs into eight categories of annotations identified by a set of different icons, as you can see. Uh, the most obvious annotation is norm normally a vocabulary note. So we decided to set vocabulary notes apart and this can be distinguished by a subtle dotted line underneath the word or phrase that requires explanation. So that's done with, but we wanted to increase other you know, competences while reading. We chose a city of books, another story from the collection to create this second prototype. 
Well, this tale is loaded with cultural references with which today's children uh, might be unfamiliar. So we thought it was a good candidate not to do this rich edition. We worked in collaboration with a company called Support Factory. This is a company of developers specialized in applying technology to educational projects. The original idea was that they would create a second prototype and then we would replicate its structure in the following tales. Well, in the end, this was not possible and we required a programmer throughout the whole process. But our customized, customized second pilot has allowed us to create uh, three versions uh, for each story. We have the Spanish version, the English, and a contrastive version, a bilingual version, with integrated sound and differentiated icons to signal different types of annotations. Well, for example, uh, programming interactive activities is very expensive, so we limited them to one or two per tale. An important concern for us was not to saturate the pages with too many notes. We, we were afraid no, of interrupting the flow of reading. And we also wanted to introduce in each story a variety of annotation um, categories. But at this point, we also had many questions like how many notes are too many or, or which category of annotation is most useful uh, for teachers maybe or which are more attractive for children uh, how do we put the oral uh, narration do we put it in full or is it better to clip it to fit the content of each page uh, we decided that we needed another uh, evaluation and that's what we did uh, from the pool of teachers that had been first um, used in the survey, uh, only a quarter, only 25 teachers were willing to dedicate class time to test and evaluate our second pilot. So we prepared an experimentation model to apply in the classroom with pre-questionnaires, post-questionnaires, with participant observation and interviews. And we analyzed the results of their experiences and for our third and final prototype, which would be implemented in the 16 stories, we included, uh, for example, a didactic guide per tale with a summary of the story, with some activities so that the teacher will have it very easy. Um, we also inserted the audio in two manners and we created a web page to insert the whole project with um, a general didactic guide that would serve as an introduction for teachers with some ideas on how to implement and how to use this tool in the classroom. And then for children, we prepared a video uh, in which one of the protagonists of the story explains to the children how was the life uh, of children like a hundred years ago as a way to introduce them in the, in the period they will be reading. So, um, there have been, then after the project was finished, different researchers carried out uh, evaluations of the tool in different school settings. We can talk a little bit more about this um, in the discussion, but now I think I have to hurry up. But I think the most important thing we detected is that um, we, you know, taking into consideration the three research studies, more or less a thousand students have been using interactive Calleja. Um, and we identified a significant gap between urban and rural schools regarding the optimal use of the tool. And, and I think the, the most uh, important, um, or what we identified no, as, the, as the most important determinant for the success of the tool was the ratio, the ratio of how many computers per student no, the school had. Um, well, in Madrid and in the Basque country, in the more urban areas, um, the, the teachers found the tool like very um, useful and they selected student motivation as one of the main psychopedagogical effects of reading using a, a digital edition. Children like to read on the screen more than on paper. And they all agreed that um, uh, they 
they had noticed an improvement in students' concentration. And this for us was kind of a surprise because they they this they connected student concentration with the fact that um, the reading was fragmented and uh, it was they they had to carry out like different proposed activities uh, that were sequenced in a way that maybe they were reading, but they didn't realize how much they were reading. Uh, however, in the most uh, rural um, areas, uh, the the tool was um, not so well, you know, exploited, and um, um, we, we realized that not only students but teachers didn't have the basic digital skills to be able to profit no, from this tool. However, in the Basque Country, uh, a researcher even suggested that we could use enrich digital editions for children that are diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, that maybe we could even use eye tracking technology uh, together with, you know, these kind of um, enriched editions, which I think would be a very promising area of study. So now to um, more or less reach the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about the workflow, which was actually what I wanted to do from the beginning. Um, Probably this was the hardest and most time consuming endeavor of the whole project. And it was finding the correct workflow to carry out such massive uh, tasks. We had of course, many live meetings and discussions among the groups and partners involved. Um, we had to, uh, we had information and data flows across faces reported to the different team members regularly. Actually, in this chart, I have just identified a taxonomy of tasks um, that more or less coincide with the five main stages in our research. Concept, prototype, evaluation, production, and final publication. But obviously, reality is not so neat and the process is not so linear uh, since uh, many processes had to be carried out simultaneously. For instance, conception and prototyping or prototyping and evaluation. There were certain loops no? uh, between the first prototype and the second. We had to evaluate the tool, etc. But what can we say about this workflow? Well, from a conceptual perspective, um, I think um, collaboration and trust among different teams and also team members is essential so that the information, for example, the discoveries, that information flows and is not retained in important phases of the project. Distributing work efficiently is also key. The two research groups involved in the second and third prototypes divided the work in this manner. The Lithi group would do the Spanish version, focusing on promoting a critical and creative reading in Spanish. And Atlas would focus on the English and bilingual versions oriented to teaching English as a second language. So we had different objectives, but we had to agree. And we discussed a lot upon the, the common model we were going to use. And then we allow certain freedom so that each group could adjust some features of the enriched model to fit the each version's needs. And, and we will see that in the English version, we have we needed to add some more icons, for example. Um, from a methodological perspective, uh, we combine peer review evaluations for both the massive translations with students and also the annotations. So there were many, many different stages of revision and revision. And in the end, of course, everything ended up with a hierarchical edition and correction in the correction in the final stage, which was done by the project uh, PIs. From a technical perspective, there were problems associated with the fragmentation of objectives. And maybe this is something we would have done differently. Since we began by enriching just one or two tales at a time in the first two prototypes, developers wrote code without taking into consideration the global size of the project, that we had to replicate that in 16 other stories. So the project Interactive Calleja is programmed 
using a hybrid model that mixes single page application, a single page application model for the tails, for each individual tail. But this is um, comprised or introduced in a multi-page environment for the whole web that we have created. So the use of a single page application, which is a type of web application that loads a single initial page from the server and then dynamically updates its content um, through user interactions without the need to, to load additional pages from the server. Well, the main feature of this is that it provides a very smooth and fast user experience. You can uh, maybe check out the tails and I think it, it works well. It works similarly to a desktop top application. However, since all three versions, the Spanish, the English, and the bilingual would load at the same time, uh, well, programmers need to be very organized uh, with how they write the HTML so that correction, you know, it's easy. But in this case, corrections, correcting mistakes was like a never ending task because you introduce a correction in one place and somehow you made an error in some other place of the web page of the HTML. I had to do the final corrections with the programmer beside me who did not speak English well enough. And this was a problem. But the major problem is that he didn't understand what a text is from a philological perspective. And I think we should emphasize the need of having programmers that are also versatile enough, that know uh, the humanities need well enough to, to be of help. Scaling the second prototype for the 16 stories was complicated. And I believe it was because the first team of developers did not have the whole project in mind when designing the second prototype. Thus, they were not too careful with the HTML architecture. It works well, but underneath, I think the code is a bit messy. Well, to organize our work, we used Trello. This was like our infrastructure. Uh, it was. Uh, it proved to be very efficient and easy to use. And I don't know if we should consider stuff as part of the workflow infrastructure, but. One thing that we also learned from this project is that too many collaborators have made have made the work possible in a short time span, but complicated extremely the correction process due to difficulties associated with the correct transmission of information, not to speak of copyright registration, which is really, well, we haven't finished doing that. It's very complicated. So my conclusions. After carrying out a project that has lasted more than three years, you can imagine that there come some lessons to, to be learned. Uh, and this is what I would like to share with you today uh, with the hope that you can learn from our mistakes. Of course, there were also some aspects that I think we did uh, that we approach well and benefited the outcome. For example, we were constantly preoccupied with not saturating the page with too many annotations. Well, the English version is far more loaded than the Spanish one. However, our fear of interrupting the flow of reading with the annotations turned out to be unfunded uh, since students appreciated a fragmented reading experience. And for us, this, this was something you know surprising. Regarding the workflow model chosen, well, it actually worked very well, you know, like a well oiled machine. Even though it was the first time the Letty and Atlas groups worked together, I think that highly motivated participants were essential, as well as highly committed PIs. And then probably the fact that both groups had a very long had very long trajectories before undertaking this task. You know, we have been working together for more than ten years. And this certainly has helped to create trust and collaboration among us. A crucial decision was to adventure beyond commercial software. And I hope that creating the project using the building blocks of the web, you know, like simple HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript will stretch its lifespan. However, we are aware that this makes 
the integration in libraries, CMS, uh, a bit more difficult. Um, don't know, impossible. Um, I think uh, to finish that there are aspects no, that uh, we could have done differently. And uh, maybe this is what, sorry, I think I'm going to go up. Yeah, uh, things that we would have done differently. In future editions, I think we would opt for substituting the original image, the digitized image, for a totally responsive page that imitates the digitized feel of the original, but is able to adapt to smaller devices. Well, I realize this is a bit of a forgery. This is what we have done in the English version, but nevertheless, I think the advantages outnumber the limitations. Well, and moreover, we, we recommend keeping the number of collaborators small so that bureaucracy is not overwhelming. Custom-made solutions uh, remain expensive, and I believe we should strive to develop a CMS like Turning the Pages or Magazine, but that allows to customize annotation icons, select page areas, and integrate sound easily. And maybe this could be the result of a collaboration between universities, research teams, and private companies. The model we have developed for an enriched children collection can have other applications within the field of scholarly critical editions. And this is where I wanted to show us, to show you some examples. Take, for example, this version of The Wasteland. It's an incredible work. And it was carried out not by a philologist, but by Ricard Parker, who is a software engineer. And he did this in his free time. It's amazing. He devoted a lot of time to think uh, how was he going to organize you know, different types of annotations. And he devised a color and column system to distinguish different uh, categories of annotations. But I think that maybe we use differentiated icons that can insert, you know, the layers of commentary on the page. This would allow to have a less image saturated, you know, window. And of course, you do not need to fragment uh, the screen. So this is an idea. Another idea could be, for example, if we take this edition of the Beowulf, the double page format that we used in the bilingual version could be used to provide the original source and its diplomatic uh, transcription and insert audio clips per page. Uh, whereas in this digital edition, the audio is a single file and it's very easy to lose track. Um, if you insert audio clips per you know, fragment of text, it's, it's very, this is very useful for teachers. And then in the original digital version, the two windows are not synchronized. And this also makes sometimes uh, following the digitized text difficult. Well, uh, to conclude, this is my final sentence, I promise. I think it has been my contention during the development of this project that we need to keep a balance between the investment on digitization processes on the one hand and accessibility initiatives like ours on the other so that the digitization effort is amortized. We also need to choose formats that can be made with open source software, which I hope can be more resilient to obsolescence than commercial software. Or we might run the risk of dedicating vast resources to projects that nobody uses or very few people use and become obsolete before the idea they are due, as it has happened to the Shakespeare Quartos archive. I'm, I'm really very sad because uh, I'm also a teacher of Renaissance drama, uh, and I really wanted to use this tool, but um, it's no longer available. And um, in this page, you can see that the technologies with which it is built with have reached end of life. I, I don't know exactly which technologies were used, uh, probably Flash, but I would really would like to know if somebody has more information about why this project is no longer online, I would really appreciate it. Uh, well, this is the bibliography I've used about to gather data about digitization, et cetera. And that's all from my part. I hear which give you my email in case you want to uh, ask any further questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.